So it's no secret, more than 100 years ago, a 15-year-old uh, girl left Vilnius for Chicago, USA, and that was my grandmother. At the same time, roughly, a slightly older young boy left Riga for Chicago, and that was my grandfather. So you say I'm half Baltic, and the other half is Irish, so I haven't decided which will predominate today. So let's get started. Um, we have the show? Good. So I wanted to talk uh, this morning about green buildings and sustainable cities, and I'll kind of start with the green building side and, and switch over to sustainable cities. But the whole notion here is, you know, how do we, how do we bridge the gap between where we are now and where we want to be? So that is sort of the question for the day. Um, is the gap a real chasm? There's the Grand Canyon. Some of you, I'm sure, have been there. Um, or is it just going to be a continuous development? And uh, I would argue that it's probably more of a chasm. And uh, the last part of my presentation will be what I think are some innovative ideas to bridge that uh, chasm. So um, the first thing you want to do if you want to say, well, wh what should we do? You have to pose the question. And uh, some people may know the Buckminster Fuller was a US architect and futurist who did a lot of writing in the second half of the 20th century. But one of the things that always stood out for me among his writings was this, this idea that if you ask the right questions, theoretically, you have the answers 100% of the time, and in practice, 50% of the time. So the first idea is let's ask the right questions. And, um, Sustainable cities can't just be about reducing carbon emissions. And I think that, you know, we get easily caught up in that, you know, energy efficiency equals green equals sustainable. But it's clear that there's a lot more at stake here. Uh, we have to think about water cycle management, biodiversity, uh, people, mobility, housing. All of these go together into the realm of sustainability because if you don't do one of those right, you're not going to get the other ones as well. Um, and more importantly now, how can we leverage new technologies? You know, I'm doing my timing here on an iPhone. I have a little stopwatch here. It'll probably beep when I'm supposed to get off the stage. Um, 11 years ago, it didn't exist, right? We all had flip phones, those of us who had phones. When I was a kid, there was a comic book strip coming in the newspaper. And the characters were the police uh, characters, and they were talking to each other on their wrist. I can do that now with my wife in America. Think about it. So technology is the driver of all of these things, and particularly software-enabled uh, technologies. And uh, that's where we have to go. And finally, we have to measure progress. You know, the old saying, if you can't manage it if you don't measure it. So how are we going to measure it? And so one of the ways that um, we've come up with to measure things is, is the green building movement. But I would argue that there's a lot of disruption ahead. And if you just look at Uber as an example of a disruptive technology, Uber is the largest car company in the world. It doesn't own any cars. It's disrupted government in every city and disrupted business, right? Because we've hung on to this more than 100-year-old idea of taxi cabs. So all of a sudden, the technology is pushing because I can go outside the hotel here and call an Uber car and get wherever I want to go and know what the cost is ahead of time and be able to rate the driver. And by the way, the driver can rate me as a passenger. This is all what's happening real time. And so government is being pushed, business is being pushed to make changes. But let's start uh, back a little. How do we get here? So here's a little drawing of my latest book called Reinventing Green Building. And the idea is we started up here in the early 90s with the Bream system. Around 1998, the first version of LEAD, uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design was created. Um, we have a program for office buildings in the U.S. called Energy Star, and we had then Japan, Canada, Australia, and so on. 
to where there's now 100 green building councils around the world, in every part of the world. So this has been an evolution over the last 25 years. And, and that is why we're here today, because this stuff has been happening all along. And so um, we now have, uh, in the Breen system, well over 100,000 buildings rated, in the LEED system, over 40,000. So lots of things have been happening. Um, and so you could see the numbers, uh, about 20, 25% of LEED certifications outside the US. There's a few here in Lithuania. But there's now 600 building certification programs worldwide. Doesn't that sound a little confusing? Um, it depends on where you are and so forth. Uh, but the only two global eco-labels at this point are Bream and LEED, and then the World Bank International Finance Corporation has one called EDGE, which is coming up strong as a third system. And, and we've got a lot of benefit. So these buildings are more resource efficient. They are generally healthier buildings. Um, and, and we've improved building design, and we've got much better building materials than when I started in this movement roughly 20 years ago. A lot of office benefit, a lot of economic benefits. In the US, we're seeing higher rents, greater resale value, lower operating costs, um, faster letting of buildings. So if you're a developer, one of the issues for you is how fast am I going to get people in my building after I built it? Because that's when I start to get collect rent and pay off all those loans. Um, and so what we find is in the office sector that a green buildings pretty much are there because of tenant demand. Developers do it because tenants, particularly multinationals, want the label to meet their own commitments to sustainability. Um, it also helps, if you will, to future-proof your buildings against competition because you know that somebody is going to build another building near yours if yours is successful and that they're going to get a label you're going to have to compete with them. And I say it may lead to higher productivity and health outcomes. We just don't have the data yet to show that for sure. And productivity is a really interesting one. In the US, because we go by square feet instead of square meters, we have a rule called 33300. You spend $3 a year per square foot on energy. You spend $30 per square foot on rent. And you spend $300 per square feet on people salaries and benefits. So it stands to reason that if I could increase productivity from the people in this building by even 1%, that's equal to my entire energy bill. So we lose something if we just focus on energy because it's people who really matter <coughs> in buildings and what they do and what they produce. Um, and, and so the actual numbers are even more convincing. As we start to get less space per person in buildings, so in the last few years, we've gone with open plan offices, we've gone from about 13 square meters per person down to nine square meters per person. The cost of the person per square meter goes up, right? That's pretty simple math. Um, so you can just kind of see what it looks like. Actually, the energy costs in the US are only about $2.50 per square foot. Multiply by 11, you get square meters. Uh, and you could see it's, it's pretty cheap uh, in the US. So a lot of successes. We've redefined architectural practice and education. We've redefined what engineers think they can do in buildings. So all of a sudden, we were doing 200 kilowatt hours a year per square meter energy use. Now we're down well below 100 in a lot of buildings. And in a book I wrote about four years ago, I found a project in Taiwan that was using only 40 kilowatt hours per square meter, an academic building. Um, we have better construction quality, and certainly we've got education for policymakers and government agencies. But along the way, something happened. We started with a very simple idea. I'll look at the energy use of a building. I'll look at the water use. I'll look at the land use implications. I'll look at building materials and sort of their environmental features. And I'll look at the indoor environment. That was sort of the, the core idea. And I used to teach. I was one of the first 10 instructors for the lead system in the US in 2001 and I would teach this and you could go through the whole thing in a day and cover everything that is not possible you get to cover one-tenth of it in a day so we started with a simple idea 
and wound up with a very complex one. Maybe you know this phrase, that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. And we, we have now is a four-humped camel. I couldn't find a drawing of one, but you'll have to imagine that. So we started with a simple idea. We've really made it complicated. There are now more than 10,000 interpretations of the lead system that a consultant, it's like some of my hosts here, have to master. Good thing that they do, because you need to know that to get the label. But as a result, the growth plateaued. So in the US, you can see that the numbers, um, non-residential projects really are plateauing around 3,000 a year. That's still a lot of projects, but the US is a very big country. And so it, it is a small part of the market. At the end of 2015, we had only reached 0.7% of the buildings after 15 years of hard work. So the point here is not to denigrate LEED or BREAM or any of the green building rating systems. It's simply to say that's for the high end of the market. That's for the aspirational side of the market. We need to work on all buildings uh, if we're going to solve energy and carbon problems. So we said, OK, well, the next big thing is existing buildings. We're only doing six to 700 a year in the US out of more than 5.5 million. If you want to do percentages, it's 0.01%. Not 1%, not a tenth of a percent, but a hundredth of a percent on an annual basis. Clearly, we're trying to stop global temperature rise at 2 degrees Celsius. We're not going to cut it if it's going to take us 10,000 years to get you know, all of the buildings done. So I began to think, well, you know, what, what's the deal here? And I think the point is that it's great to have the labels, it's great to have super buildings as models for everybody else to help change codes, to help change practices, to get better building materials, because manufacturers aim at that high end of the market. That's good stuff. But it's not gonna get us where we need to go. And I think that's sort of the, if we're gonna decarbonate our societies, we've gotta do it much faster. Um, building codes help, but building codes, remember, raise the floor. They don't affect kind of up above here where we all want to go. And so what's happened, we're not getting widespread adoption. We're getting, in marketing parlance, the innovators and early adopters, which is in total no more than one-sixth of the total market. So I began to ask, what we have now looks like this. This is a, a abstract expressionist painting. You remember, you take buckets of paint on a canvas on the floor and you, you dump the paint all over the canvas, right? very popular movement in the 1950s and, and 60s. And uh, unfortunately, you wind up with systems that look like that. So I thought to myself, what's a better mental model? Because we all work on mental models. And if you think of a sculptor, a sculptor takes an undifferentiated block of granite and makes something beautiful out of it. So I began to think, what could we do that would still achieve our overall objectives or get us 80% of the way to our super objectives that would somehow meet the test of the market. And my, my thought was, well, you know, if you look at the existing building systems, they're all about relative improvement. We have cut energy use compared to a standard building by 20 or 30%, right? That's relative improvement those buildings will still generate lots of carbon emissions from the electricity they use. So we really have to say we need to be absolutely better, meaning we need to, get, need to get buildings like this to zero net energy use on an annual basis. And so that is really the big challenge. So if you think about a, a kind of what we call it a spider diagram, like a spider web, um, energy should be at zero. And how close can I get to that? Net waste generation should be at zero. You know, um, purchasing, everything we buy should meet sustainable eco criteria, 100%. Scope three carbon, the induced emissions, that would be the commute to work. That would be um, freight in and out, inbound and outbound freight. Things that you do that induce emissions. So I'm a great fan of Amazon.com. But if I think about it from an ecological perspective, I'm not driving to a store to buy something, but they're driving the truck to me to deliver it. So what have we really gained? It's fun for me, but is there any net benefit? 
Um, so that's kind of a scope three emissions, and, and I mentioned purchasing. So the idea was, let's go back to basics and maybe think about reinventing ourselves where we, we focus on absolute numbers and, um, and get smarter. So then the question became, well, how do you get smarter? You have to do it with technology. You cannot sort of go back to where we were 25 years ago. And so I have the phrase, make the trend your friend. And this is about trends. And if you look at technology trends, it's about making everything better, faster, cheaper, smaller, lighter, right? So uh, I'm carrying around in my little iPhone here um, the equivalent of what I had when I was a kid, which is two bookshelves of encyclopedias, right? Heavy encyclopedias that required a salesperson to come to the house and sell it to us. Of course, my parents bought everything they could because they had five children and they were determined to make sure they were educated. Um, that's all on my phone. That is, those systems are gone. If you go to a, my father's legal office, it would, everyone had a library. You don't need that anymore. So this is kind of technology trends. And so commercial real estate, part of the topic here, is converging rapidly with the aid of technology in certain areas. And so my feeling is that green building and sustainable cities can actually piggyback on these trends, these mega trends. And, and so the idea is to get tech savvy, always connected, always uh, on smart green buildings and smart green cities. And if you look at what's happening in commercial real estate, there's this convergence on building operations of IT, computer, uh, internet systems, uh, sustainability and energy are all sort of coming together. And what's driving all of this sustainability conversation and technology conversation are these four forces. You have building owners. We usually think that the building owner is the decision maker, but that building developer uh, has to go out and get money somewhere. You're building a $50 million building, you're not doing it with your own money. We have a president now of the United States who figured that out quite well. You know, oh, we call it OPM, other people's money. So you go out and you go to investors. And your investors today are more and more global pension funds. That all of the baby boomers who are now retiring and the next generation are coming along, those are all pension funds investing in real estate. And if you were investing money that had to be paid out in the future, you would want quality buildings. And more and more pension funds are saying, we have to have certified green buildings that meet the right criteria if you want our equity investment. At the same time, banks are saying, well, we don't want to be left behind. We want to be green too. So now I go for my debt money from banks. So you know, the, the investors, the, the lenders, the tenants are saying, well, wait a minute. I'm the one that's paying salaries and benefits. I'm the one that's paying energy costs. I want to be in buildings that are healthier for people, that have lower operating costs. So they're pushing, right? And then finally, what's pushing is reporting requirements, global reporting initiative, sustainability reporting of all kinds. Because you know, if you are a business owner, what makes you money is not what smarts you have in your head. It's all those people working <laughs> to execute your vision. And those people, if they're good, can work anywhere. They can work for any company. And if you're under 30, you probably care about environment, sustainability, et cetera. And you're gonna look at these reports and see whether these companies are actually doing what they say they're doing when they go to recruit you. So these are a, a sort of a combination of forces that are driving the whole sustainable conversation. And if you look at green buildings that are smart, you find that an intelligent building, yes, it saves energy, it operates efficiently, it has sustainable outcomes, it has a great occupant experience, and it's also financially better. So this is the, the sort of the driving forces here to make people want to do this. And so then I said, well, let's use next generation tools for smart buildings. By the way, I will send this slideshow to Lithuanian Green Building Council. They will post a link so that you can all have it. Um, we have big data analytics. So we have, uh, I think there were 15 billion connected devices in the world in 2015, two for every person in the world. The forecast by 2025 is 75 billion. 
or about 10 devices for every person. That, that is a, a piece of data that can then be analyzed. Leveraging algorithms to measure sustainability. Algorithms is one of those great words. It simply means, if this happens, do that. It's an instruction, right? Or a set of instructions. Um, cloud computing offers a fresh start. After all, Green Building's 25 years old. When I first submitted my first lead projects for certification, they went in three ring binders, six copies to Washington, D.C. It was quite expensive, uh, and that was in 2001. So we could do all this in the cloud now. Um, and we need a low-cost approach. So that, that is going to drive the marketplace. And so I would say, sort of my slogan here is, technology trends are your friend. Moving fast is the method to use and ingenuity is the means. And so that's, that's kind of where we need to go. And so key components here, Internet of Things, all those devices, cheap sensors. So basically, every person in your building that has a watch, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, can also have a pollution sensor. Total VOCs, total volatile organic compounds. And you can then have software that is GPS for inside the building that can actually tell you where that reading was taken. That can all be uh, amalgamated into a big data system and provide the person in charge, whoever that is, with instant information about quality, which can then feed back to the building operating system. This is all available today. Not everyone's using it, obviously, but this is available today. So you have cloud computing that enables that, mobile devices and all the apps, and then the analytics. You know, my first uh, job as an engineering student in the summer was they gave me a bunch of utility uh, cost data and I got to prepare graphs and charts. And for a young engineering student at that time, that was just heaven. You actually got to do something that you were studying, right? It's totally obsolete. The, sm the smarts that were in my head are now all in the software. What I have to have smarts about is, well, what do I do about it once I know what's happening? Um, and so the idea is measure and manage everything in real time. You can do this with cities too. You can measure and manage traffic congestion. You can measure and manage pollution levels all in real time. You have automated reporting so that you don't worry about, well, I, gee, I got to now get all this data. Uh, I used to write environmental impact reports in California quite a, a few years ago. And you get all the data, now you got to write the report. It, it's all automated now. Um, the analysis is automated. The messaging is automated. So if I have a, a, a system that is, has a residential high-rise building and I'm measuring water flow, and all of a sudden I see on the 10th floor that water flow is now 10 times the norm, what does that tell me? There's a leak. Now, it always happens on Saturday night, right? That's when your water heater breaks and so forth. So. Yes, but I have a plumber on call if I'm operating a building. I have service people that are on call. They get the SMS message right away. And they go take care of it. Because otherwise the tenants are going to start moving out. You know, if I don't take care of these things. I can then compare one building versus another. One, my buildings versus a benchmark of similar buildings. So the International Council of Shopping Centers now, for example, has a database of more than 2,000 shopping centers in terms of uh, operating parameters. It's all anonymized, but I can see how my center ranks versus everybody else's and, and then adjust it for weather, location, occupancy, and so forth. And everything then visualized because half of us are visual learners. Now, I come from the engineering side. I'm very comfortable with spreadsheets and graphs, but my friends who are architects want to see it visually. And visual is, you know, where human beings can spot tiny movements at 100 meters, right? We had to in our evolution. So you can see changes in color, gradations in color. You can see all that, and it says something to you right away. So building energy use can be now done with 15-minute interval data. Every 15 minutes, how much electricity? It can then be color-coded. So I can see immediately, oh, at 2 o'clock in the morning last Tuesday, uh, my office building energy use spiked way above the norm. What happened? Now you go investigate. 
Well, we hired a new cleaning company to do the office cleaning, and nobody told them how to turn off the lights floor by floor. So they just turned on all the lights in the building. And, the inter and I wasn't there. Nobody was there. They were cleaning the building. So now, all of a sudden, you know there's a problem, and you can do something about it. And so the result is you get buildings like this. They call it edge computing. Some of you may have heard that phrase. Um, when you're out at the end of the line taking measurements. Here's a building in Amsterdam. It's, until very recently, the highest rated uh, green building in the world. Um, 27,000 sensors in that building are feeding data back into the building operating system. And this is, by the way, the uh, European headquarters for Deloitte. So again, tenant driven. They wanted to be in the most green building. The, the greenest one now is the Bloomberg headquarters in uh, London, slightly higher BREAM rating. Bloomberg is big on environment and big on sustainability. He wanted to have the bragging rights. Um, and so what can you do here? Let's bring it home. Um, you need vision as well as technology. You need to have a vision about where do we want to go and how do we, how do we want to get there. But you don't need to wait 5, 10, 15 years to get started. What you need are big, audacious goals. You need a bag. Um, there's another word that gets in there between big and audacious that I didn't use. Um, but you need audacious goals. You need to say, we have got some problems here. Our cities are shrinking. People are leaving. We need to improve the economy, et cetera. Um, you have to rapid prototyping. Try different things in different areas. Try Try to get something going rather than having the perfect solution ready in five years. Um, one of the ideas that I like is one called eco-districts, where you actually bring things down to a level of maybe uh, five city blocks times seven city blocks. And you look at the environmental performance of that district. And there's a, a site you can go to, ecodistricts.org, that has been pioneering this approach for the last decade. What about crowdsourcing new ideas? You know, those who work in government and business and NGOs, you know you're limited. You only have so much time. You only have so much background. Let's get good ideas from the whole community um, and maybe offer X prizes for results. I'll explain that in a minute. And maybe create something dramatic. I was in Kenya in uh, March giving a talk like this to uh, the African Green Building Summit. And I had the idea, well, why not something I'm going to call Project Leapfrog? How can you get quickly to the next level? So if you look at Kenya as an example, uh, it's a nice economy, it's a growing society. They don't have banks, basically. Everything you do is paid for by your phone. When you want to pay for something, you go into a grocery store or someplace to a kiosk and you load up some additional credits on your phone. They don't need to build 5,000 branch banks to service people in the, in the town. Um, because of mobile phone revolution, they don't need to lay copper wires all over the continent the way we did in the 20th century. So this is a kind of leapfrogging technology allows you to do that. You don't need to build big power plants if you put solar and wind and distributed renewables on all those nice rooftops you have. Uh, so that's the idea. So what's an X Prize? This is uh, some, has anybody heard of X Prize? No, okay. Um, it's a highly leveraged, incentivized prize competition, pushes the limits of what's possible to change the world at different levels. Captures imagination, inspires others with similar goals, spurs innovation, accelerates positive changes. Well, that's a lot of nice words. The first X Prize was offered in 1994. It was a $10 million incentive to inspire a new generation of private passenger carrying spaceships. Within 10 years, there was a winner. So this drove innovation. Remember, if you go back to 1994, no, the, the government would say, well, by 2050, we'll be sending you know, passengers into space. That was kind of the vision of our space agency in the US. The winning vehicle was piloted to space twice within two weeks to win the competition. It took only 10 years. There are similar competitions going on now to tackle health problems around the world, get rid of malaria, uh, tackle sanitation, which is a huge issue in the third world. So why can't we think here, how do we leapfrog into the future? How do we get past some of our constraints 
and go further. P people know this game, kids game, leapfrog, yeah. Um, and so the clear precedents I mentioned, mobile payments, mobile phones, distributed power. Beijing says we'll never solve our air pollution problem, conventional ways. So we're just going to have no fossil fueled autos in the city. Everything electric by 2030 if you're going to drive in the city of Beijing. Chinese can actually enforce that. Whether they do it's another question. But all of a sudden you thought, well, how do we regulate air pollution? Well, we got to regulate the tailpipes coming out of the cars, right? And now we know that tens of millions of cars cheated on those tests, thanks to some of our big car makers. Um, why not just take an end run around that problem? Go all electric, and now suddenly you don't have to worry about urban air pollution from autos. You still have to think about factories and so forth. Um, and a space-based web, which is coming quickly, is going to make massive data transfers almost free. So this is going to help the developing world, but also all the rest of us. So can a technology leapfrog put smart building measures into every building? You can now rate every building with off-the-shelf software platforms. As long as you have uh, data coming in from electric utilities, which we, we have now in the US, every 15 minute data, you can rate the building against any rating system you want. And so that is, that's off the shelf. That means you can now buy it commercially. So why do this? The old ways won't scale in time, getting back to my earlier message. And if you think about, uh, I was having a conversation with a, a journalist yesterday, and I said, you know, if something is economically feasible, I mean economically beneficial, then the only real issue is finance. If I know it's a good thing to do, how do I pay for it? Because most of what we're talking about, particularly in energy, is I'm going to make a capital investment now. I'm going to save operating money in the future. Right? That's the essence of the proposition. What we have now is a finance program, green finance tools in the US, called PACE Financing, P-A-C-E, Property Assess Clean Energy. And it was just a conceptual insight. Somebody said, well, why does the owner of a building have to borrow money to upgrade the energy performance. Why can't the building borrow the money and pay for it on the annual property tax in such a way that the annual payments on the loan are less than the savings from the investment? The green finance is the next big innovation to hit the green building world. That will allow us to reach the existing building market. And if you think about creating scale in a hurry, I mentioned Uber earlier. But Airbnb, which I stayed in in Stockholm uh, last weekend, Airbnb is the world's largest hotel company. They have more rooms every night on, on offer than any hotel company in the world, and they don't own a single hotel. Their capital investment was all in software, right? Same with Uber. So um, there are lots of examples of this. This is the world that we're living in. And so the lesson here is if you're short on money, you have to be long on ingenuity. And so if you feel like sometimes we don't have enough money to do what we really need to do, it's time for ingenuity. Uh, and so let's focus on outcomes and not inputs. Um, rapid sustainability pathways. We already have EU mandates for A plus and A plus plus buildings. We have a program called Build Upon for the existing buildings. Um, we have an ability to rethink our whole approach to water use. Um, 20th century water use was one use, flush it away, right? So now, you know, and, and rainwater, I was trained as a civil engineer, what you're supposed to do with rainwater is get it out of the city as fast as possible. You know, and it's somebody else's problem downstream. Um, purchasing, we can buy only planet positive products today. All of that data is there, all of the evaluations have been made, you can buy software databases. The US government has one now with 300,000 products in it. We fully evaluated against all environmental criteria. In fact, the database will tell you which of the criteria it meets. So you say, well, I want to meet this cradle to cradle uh, criteria, and it'll give you those products. That goes in your purchasing catalog. Your purchasing agents can only buy those things, and it makes it work. Um, and carbon accounting. And so the whole point about this is we have to 
I would say focus obsessively on lowering costs and improving user experience for all of our green tools and our green thinking. And support promising technology. Some people may have heard of blockchain technology, but blockchain technology, which is it's used with Bitcoin, the sort of uh, alternative currencies, but blockchain can allow me as a homeowner to generate more electricity than I need and to sell it directly to somebody else and receive credit for that sale. And then when I need more than I'm generating from my rooftop solar system, I can buy it through that same system. So this is like the tools that are out there, artificial intelligence. Um, there's a software company in the US that does remote building audits. Okay, that's my stop in a few minutes note. Uh, it does remote building audits. They've taken all the best practices for building renovations. Uh, you, if, they, if you know, they know your energy use, your building type, the use of the building, and your, your climatic location, they can tell you right away what are the most cost-effective measures to invest in, and you pick, starting at the top, for the most cost-effective as much as you want to invest. The U.S. government has already done this to save tens of millions of dollars annually in building operations, never sending an engineer out to audit a building. Because if you do that one building at a time, you will be forever trying to get that done. There aren't enough engineers that know what they're doing to do that. But the system is smarter than any individual. That's sort of the point here. And finally, vir virtual reality. If you're going to design, redesign your urban planning system, why not get everybody in the game? We have SimCity. We have all of these different uh, games that people can play. Let's see what they can come up with. Engage is the, is the name here. What are we, what's the benefit? Well, I think for here, the benefit of going 100% renewable, which I understand uh, is your goal by 2050, can probably be achieved quite a bit faster. And the economic benefit for a country like this, which buys a lot of energy, is huge. There has to be some thinking like, we need to get away from those people um, buying energy, whoever they are. I mean, I was, I was thinking, well, you have this nice coastline, you could just put a liquid LNG uh, terminal in and buy it from the US. But you're still buying gas from somebody else and you're still sending your money abroad. So that doesn't really solve things. Uh, healthy, more productive workplaces. Huge focus right now on health in the workplace. How healthy are our buildings? Um, resilience in the face of climate change. You've got to be able to have enough uh, space in your system to deal with climate change issues. I mean, look what happened in the US. Houston, Miami, underwater, Puerto Rico still, after a month or more, more than half the country has no electricity. We never thought it would happen. Puerto Rico is part of the US. Um, develop centers of expertise. So now this is the other side. Let's be like the other small countries. Let's be like Denmark, which has a world uh, re uh, uh, reputation in wind power. And also in Sweden, city planning. Netherlands, hydraulic engineering. I mean, you don't have to believe what the Dutch say. You just have to go there and look where half the country is below sea level. And it functions well. Now the Dutch are concerned about, obviously, climate change because it's going to be the whole of western part of the Netherlands may have to be abandoned unless they figure out how they're going to deal with this. Um, and so what, what could you do here? And so I think, you know, that's, a, I think, an interesting question to deal with at the universities, at government, at the research institutes. Because you have to think about where is the ball headed? People know this picture, photo? This is the football World Cup winning kick. And this young 22-year-old uh, German has made his career for life by being in the right place at the right time with the right skills to take that pass from the sidelines and stick it in the net. And you could see the guy in the blue, was they playing Argentina? Was that, was that the uh, World Cup? I think that was the final. He has that, oh, nuts look on his face. You know, I'm too late and we just lost. So put yourself in a position to win. Let's talk smart, sustainable cities. This is now the uh, Bloomberg headquarters in London. Interesting enough, what Bloomberg did is they didn't build one of those things like the Shard. You know, sticking above the entire skyline. These things are limited, I think it's 10 stories. 
So he built two 10-story buildings instead of one 20-story building. It cost him more, but all of a sudden, nobody objected. That was a big deal. So here's how you can reach me, and slideshare.net is where I'll post the link to this presentation. So thank you very much to Lithuanian GBC for inviting me and for hosting me. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, thank you for good, good ideas and good presentation. We have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe you can stay for, for a couple of questions. Yeah. Oh, they are. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions on Slido, but uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, so just raise your hand and we'll try to answer. Um, okay, so obviously you touched a little bit upon uh, US, uh, you know, trends, right? Uh, and we have a question from Maya asking about uh, the Trump's climate change policy. And uh, is it, is it well, does it have any impact on, on the green buildings as such? I've heard of him. <laughs> We too, I guess. You know, the U.S. is a very decentralized government system. We have 50 state governments. We have 3,000 cities in the U.S., 500 large cities. Um, they all do their own thing. So if you've seen that this uh, alternative delegation at the current talks in Bonn is basically U.S. cities, corporations, etc. So basically, what happens in Washington, D.C. is not really determining what's happening in the country. And I think climate change is being dealt with at many levels. And most businesses today think it's laughable to even question it. I mean, the biggest reinsurance companies in the world are all over this issue. Swiss Re and Munich Re and all those companies. Because they're going to pay the bills for the repairs of all the floods and, and storms and so forth. So I'm not that worried about Mr. Trump. He probably won't last more than four years. Um, but he certainly has high entertainment value. So to, if you're a certain mindset. And I'm on Twitter every day, so I'm not on his feed because I don't have that much time to uh, read it. But, you know, this is, it's unfortunate, but it's not the end of the world for us. Okay, thanks. Uh, and one more question from Evaldus. Uh, what, what are the key drivers, or what is the key driver of starting uh, greening existing uh, buildings, either in Lithuania or the US or wherever yeah, in the world? So what I indicated here, I think finance is the main tool. Building owners need a reason to do something because it's tough enough to make a living owning and operating buildings. So building owners need a reason. So the PACE financing is one tool but it needs to be government enabled because government collects the taxes. So in California now, we have 2,000 contractors, uh, uh, home improvement, solar contractors, et cetera, who can participate in those in more than 200 cities and counties which collect the property tax. Because remember, I'm gonna finance the improvement with future tax payments. And so that green, you know, but there are green bonds out there there's all kinds of tools, but as I indicated, if it's cost effective to do something in strict economic terms, then the only remaining challenge is finance, and there's lots of models for how to do that. 